Okay, I think we're going. All right, thanks. Our next speaker, uh, previous speaker from American Renaissance, is Julie Langness, and he's here to talk about the Inner Reconquista. All right, greetings, everyone. Uh, first of all, I was hoping we could all thank Chris for organizing this shindig today and putting in all his time. <laughs> Excellent. And this is my uh, third Northwest Forum I've been to. And I was also hoping briefly that we could do like a show of hands. If this is your first Northwest Forum you've been to, raise your hand. Wow, okay. Lots of Northwest Forum virgins, so that's good. What about second Northwest Forum? Eli, okay. What about a third? Would be me. Okay. Fourth? Fifth? No. Yeah, very good. Okay, so yeah, this is the third Northwest Forum that I've been to. And each of them has been a tremendous honor and privilege. And part of that has been getting to speak at them. That, that's an honor in and of itself, obviously. But even more than that is the caliber of individuals I've met at the Northwest Forums I've been to. And I'd also certainly include Amren in that and smaller, similar gatherings, right? And some people would say, oh, well, of course, you know, you all agree on politics. Of course, you're going to think highly of the other people you've met. But I think it's, I think it's more than that. I think, um, you know, just on a human level, whatever, integrity, decency, whatever, you know, tactical masculine virtues that Jack Donovan talks about, strength, courage, honor, mastery. Um, I think the people I've met at these gatherings, the people in our movement, are some of the most high caliber people I've met in my life. Right? And I think that, um, you know, None of us who would say that would say it naively. We've all led pretty varied lives. We're pretty worldly people. You know, we've taken, as Jeff talked about, long, long intellectual or personal journeys to arrive at the politics we have we have today, right? We've traveled a lot, we've worked in different industries, we've gone through different permutations of political beliefs, and we've arrived here. So there's actually a, as a Tolkien nerd, there's a quote from Lord of the Rings I really like that relates to it. And, Gandalf, I think, is talking about Aragorn, and he says that Aragorn in his youth traveled far and wide throughout Middle Earth, even to, to Rune and Herod, where the stars were strange, and he learned the hearts of men, both good and evil. And I feel like we can relate to that. We all explored a lot of different intellectual or political movements or explanations before we arrived at where we are today, right? So I think that we're united by all of this. And even if on specific political questions or policies, we probably have varied or, you know, varied views or might disagree on some things. I think all of our politics arise from the same foundational emotion, foundational emotions or ideas. So first of all, I think we're all united by what you could maybe call a hyper awareness of our ancestors, right? If most people in the modern West, in the modern Occident, either don't think about their ancestors or in the case of the blue-haired social justice warriors think of them negatively, we're the opposite. We do think about our ancestors. We think about the lives that they led, the sacrifices they made to allow us to be here today. And we try to live lives that honor them. We try to be the kind of people that if they came here, they wouldn't feel shame at us. They would feel pride in what we're trying to accomplish, right? Now, inversely, we're also hyper aware of the prospect of our descendants. The question of what kind of world our descendants are going to inherit, whether they're going to still remember us, whether they're going to still speak the same language as us, whether they're going to look like us, right? Whether they're going to look back on us with uh, pride or with shame. And following from that, we're obviously, of course, also aware of all the changes and threats that are currently facing the West and facing our lands and facing this tradition that we're trying to, to usher into the future. We're hyper aware of what's going on in Europe that in Sweden, over one out of every three people is now of foreign non-European origin, right? That in Germany, by 2020, the 18 to 30 year old demographic will be majority non-European, okay? We're hyper aware of what's going on in the UK with the rape gang epidemic, that Peter McLaughlin has estimated that over 100,000 white female children in Britain have been the victims of Muslim rape gangs, okay? We're hyper aware that in the UK, 40% of all people under the age of 18 are of non-European origin. And in many ways, we're tortured by these things, by our awareness of these issues 
and were united by an intense desire for compulsion to try and fight back against them, to fight back and try to attain what I, I think is best called preservation and reconquest, right? The preservation of our lands and our cultures and our traditions, our languages, our heritage, everything like that, and the reconquest of the lands that have already either been given away or taken from us, whether it's Malmo now increasingly, whether it's big swaths of Birmingham or just different areas of the Occident in general. So that's the question that I want to talk about today is how do we achieve reconquest and preservation? And more importantly, how do we think about these issues, right? How do we approach them? So to do that, first of all, I think we need to sort of acknowledge the fact that our, our views, our goals, all the things that unite us, delineate us throughout most of the West as a revolutionary movement, right? We don't hold views that are popular among the establishment that is controlling countries like France and Sweden and the UK. So as a result, the things that we want to accomplish, the hopes we have for the future of our people, are things that are diametrically opposed by the power brokers currently controlling the West. The Angela Merkels, the George Soroses, the Harvey Weinsteins, the you know Macrones, all the individuals we, we know and love, the Justin Trudeaus, and all the others. So as a result, because of that, I think that there's a very natural tendency to sort of extrapolate from other parts of history and other revolutionary movements, right? We're all very educated people. We've all read tons of books. I'd say, you know, in terms of books we've read or things we're aware of or topics we're knowledgeable about, you know, history, sociology, psychology, economics, philosophy, etc., we're probably in the top, you know, two to five percent of society. And there's a natural tendency, and I, I certainly have this myself, to want to look at all these different historical epochs and these different revolutionary movements of the past and try to view things through that lens or kind of extrapolate from that knowledge, right? And that's not a bad thing, I don't think. Actually, on my on my website, europeancivilwar.com, I just published a series of articles by a guy named Michael Gladius, and that was the whole point. He was extrapolating from these various like counter-revolutionary struggles he talked about. But increasingly, over the time I've been focused on these issues and been coming to con conferences like this and been writing about what's going on across the West. I've kind of came to the conclusion that maybe that's not the best way of approaching these issues or thinking about them, that maybe there's a more productive way of doing so. So to talk about that, I want to briefly touch on a, a book that had a, a big impact on me. It's one that I've written about before. And it's a book called Inside the Jihad by Omar Nasiri. And Omar Nasiri is the pen name of this Islamist dude who was, uh, in the 1990s, was like a member, sort of a member of the GIA, which was an Algerian Islamist revolutionary movement. And he was sort of an early member of Al-Qaeda back like in the late 90s before 9-11. So he became a spy for the French secret police, the DGSC, but he, it was complicated. He wasn't really sympathetic to the West. I mean, he was a true believing Islamist, right? But he wrote this book later on recounting all of his experiences um, within Islamism and Al-Qaeda and all this stuff. And he wrote about his time in the training camps in Afghanistan, in uh, like Durinta and Kaldun and all these places that became famous after 9-11, right? And he wrote about all the different training he received about, you know, the explosives training and the weapons training and all the tactical training and everything else. But he also talked about um, something that one of the leaders, one of the emirs of the camp, uh, told him and all the other recruits, the, the Mujahids or whatever. Um, and the leader, his name was Ibn Sheikh, and he actually eventually became kind of famous himself. Um, but anyway, he was talking to this big group of whatever, 80 Mujahids or Islamist, you know, trainees in the camps in Afghanistan. And he said that the most important variable which would determine whether they were successful in their goals, whether the global jihad was successful, wasn't any particular tactic, and it wasn't any you know, particular weapon. It wasn't any geopolitical thing that was happening. It wasn't even any leader like Osama bin Laden or anyone else. He said the most important variable that would determine whether they were successful was the inner jihad they each fought with in their own mind every day. And it had a, a profound impact on me. And obviously, you know, neither I nor any of us sympathize with the, the Islamists. It's not like that. I mean, obviously they want to conquer our lands and subjugate us. I mean, I consider them the enemy. But I think that doesn't take away from the truth 
of what Ibn Shaykh was telling them. And I think that this is sort of a, uh, a more helpful way of approaching you know, our own geopolitical ambitions, our own dreams about what might be accomplished in the West or what might be preserved. And actually, I think it's even a thousand times more uh, germane to our struggle because unlike the Muslims who still do operate, you know, in very clan based or group based ways, we in the modern West, in North America and Europe, live in the most atomized individualistic societies ever, right? It's the whole basis of, of Western civilization now is this individualism and, you know, sort of anti group identity and, you know, the freedom of the individual and all this atomization. And I think that that makes this this question of, um, of you know, of, in their case, inner jihad, but in our case, inner reconquest, even that much more important, all right? So that's what I want to uh, to talk about today, is what what are, you know, the battles we each fight in our mind every day that are relevant to our political goals? What are these things that we can either succeed at or fail at, and how are, how are they relevant to our struggle for our desire for Western civilization not to die or, or be conquered, right? So the first one that I want to talk about is the issue of time, right? And it sounds really basic, but again, in the modern West, unlike any other society throughout history, every millisecond of our time is under assault. It's trying to be hijacked, right? Every single millisecond that we spend watching television is monetized and somebody's trying to take that time from us. Every second that we spend looking at this app on our phone versus that app is earning someone money, right? Every second that countless men across the West spend, you know, watching pornography or playing video games or whatever, somebody is earning lots of money from that, okay? And not all of them, but for the most part, those individuals and forces who are trying to hijack our time are not uh, not people who share goals in common with us. They are the George Soroses and the Feinsteins and all the other people who very much want the West to to be disrupted for bad things to happen, things that we do not want, right? So on the most basic level, one of the fights we have every day, and it, it's a hard one. Like I, you know, I used to watch lots of television. I remember like three years ago, I finally quit watching TV. It was extremely hard. Like I had to like titrate down off it for like nine months and watch a little bit less at a time. Um, but you know, first of all, is just taking control of our time, not being reactive and sort of finding ourselves, um, you know, consuming all this various forms of entertainment that doesn't do anything to advance what we want to advance, but actually taking control of our time. And then from there, it sort of becomes a question of, okay, how do we utilize that time? How can we best spend the time we have on this earth, you know, spend our time every day to help achieve these goals of reconquest and preservation? So the second area following from that would be maybe what I would call creation or production. And the question of what we're doing with our time every day and how we're trying to contribute to the struggle we're all a part of, okay? So part of that would be just creating anything, not consuming. Again, the modern West, unlike any other culture throughout all of history, is almost entirely consumption-based. Everything's consumption. It's watching this or doing this or this form of entertainment or that form of entertainment. And it is a real battle to actually produce things, to create things. And if we're going to be successful politically, that's something that all of us, you know, should focus on every day is how are we producing things or creating things that are going to advance our cause, right? And there's a refrain that I think we all hear a lot on, on the websites we all frequent or at conferences like this, like, oh, the last thing we need is another writer. The last thing we need is another YouTube creator. The last thing we need is another blogger, whatever. And I, I understand that because certainly there's other things that we need too, definitely. But I disagree with it. I think that, I mean, if you think about it, there's what, 7 billion people on Earth, and probably 1 billion of them are either Occidentals like us or kind of stakeholders in Western civilization who we are trying to reach with our message, who we're trying to awaken to the threats that are facing our people and our lands. And all those billion people have different communication strategies or communication, ways of communication, different tastes, different ideas. And every single one of us that can create any kind of content, that can write or make YouTube videos or make music like Walt Bismarck or write poetry like Leo Yankovic, every single one is another front in that battle to awaken those billion people and help wake them up before our lands and cultures die out. Right? And especially, I'd say that's the case in you know what you could call like 
crossover content, right? So um, example would be the golden one, Marcus Fuller. Who, who here has watched the Marcus Fuller's YouTube channel? Right, excellent. Yeah. So he has this great YouTube channel where it's about, in part, you know, weightlifting and all this stuff like that. But it's also about identitarianism and what's going on in Europe. And all these young men who are into weightlifting and being buff and everything like that get exposed to this stuff on his channel, who otherwise might never have been exposed to these ideas, right? Or at least not exposed to them in a positive way. They would have been exposed to them through the, the prism that the mainstream media, you know, tries to portray them through. So I think that the more of us who can spend our time creating, producing, whatever it is, the better. And basically, it's just each of us asking ourselves every day, what unique skills do I have to help you know, awaken all these other people to help propel our movement forward, right? OK, so take a drink of water here. The next area that I think each of us, everyone in the modern West, certainly, does battle in every day, or that is a big part of our lives, is issue of money and personal finances, right? And I think it's probably the case that the majority of people in the modern West do not win that battle, right? They lose it. Sixty percent of our society in America has like a negative net worth, if I remember right. Right? This is some a battle that most people lose in every respect. Okay. But if we're going to be successful, we're going to be a movement that accomplishes the kind of goals we have, that's a battle that all of us need to win, right? So on the most basic level, um, you know, I mean, if you think about a, a young guy, 20 years old, 25 to 30 years old, whatever, who has the same views as us, and he wants to dedicate his life to uh, trying to fight for the future of our people, all the stuff we've spoken about today. But he's constantly stressed out about money. He's in debt. He's fighting with his girlfriend or wife about money every day. He's not going to be able to contribute to our cause at even one-tenth of the potential he otherwise would have. Right? So that's, I guess, the most basic level of this question of, of finance is how it affects us and affects our movement and our ability to contribute to it, right? But then beyond that, you know, there's another level as well, just the, the freedom and independence. Um, and I think we're all probably most, we most see that in the countless cases every year of individuals who share views who end up getting doxxed or their employer gets harassed like crazy until they fire them because something yeah we've talked about this today right something comes out that they said xyz or some video they were in from three years ago gets put online or or whatever it is or it's not even true but some for some mob of blue hair nose wing wearing, nose ring wearing social justice warriors on twitter harasses their employer until the employer fires them and they lose their ability to provide for themselves and their family and for the foreseeable future, lose the ability to get any other job, right? So, and it's, it's quite tragic really when you think about it. I mean, it, it's really horrible. But we also live today in probably the best time in the history of the world for being able to combat that and, you know, start our own businesses and, you know, build, build passive income, whatever, that enables us to be able to say whatever we want without worrying about economic censorship or without worrying about, you know, the mob of social justice warriors getting us fired, okay? And it, it's a, you know, it's it can seem a little different than all the political stuff we're talking about, but it's something I'm really passionate about and it's something I'm extremely grateful in my life that within the last few years I was able to create enough streams of income that I was able to quit my job and support myself and my family and speak at events like this, you know, in my real name and not have to worry that my employer is going to get harassed about it and fire me, okay? And, and I've met a lot of other guys, too, at events like this. We were just talking about it. some of these guys who built wealth through trading cryptocurrencies, right, or through other businesses. And now these guys are literally pouring in massive amounts of money into our movement and having a, a really profound effect upon it, right? I mean, really moving the needle. So I think it's something all of us should, should aspire to. Because if you look at the other groups we're facing, you know, the, the is, Islamists, Islamism worldwide, social justice warriors, they have basically an infinite amount of funding, right? I mean, George Soros just gave $18 billion to the whoever the hell foundation he has. It's a lot of money. I remember in the 1990s when Bill Gates became the world's first billionaire. It seemed like an insane amount of money. And now we have $18 billion being donated just to fight against the kind of politics we represent. So the more that we're able to do that, the, the more we're going to be able to help our movement. And there's no shortage of ways to, to do that. I mean, it, it really is incredible nowadays, all the different templates that exist online for being able to produce income 
independently of any job and be able to, to create, you know, uh, to be able to become financially self-supporting, right? So connected to that is obviously what I just referenced, the, the topic of donating money. And actually, that's something I, I'm doing horrible with right now. So all this stuff I'm talking about isn't stuff I'm particularly doing well with. A couple of them are okay, but the ones we'll get into in a minute, I'm doing even worse on. But obviously, there, there's some entities in our movement, right, who sort of monetize their contribution. So Vox Day has a publishing empire, right? He makes money by publishing books. Uh, Mike Cernovich seems to make money in a variety of ways. You know, the Golden One sells shirts online. He, I think he sells martial arts training or like weightlifting training. But there's other entities, you know, within our movement who we all feel quite positively about, whether Countercurrents or Amrin or V-Dare, who really have been cut off from all, um, all avenues for monetizing their contribution, monetizing the content that they are creating. And it really kind of falls to all of us who share these views to to you know fund those programs and help them move along financially. So again, it's not an area I'm doing well in, but in the past, my wife and I did quite a bit better. And the strategy that most helped us in that regard, um, whether it's that or something similar, like trying to put aside money to invest, uh, putting you know starting with like one percent of your income each month, right? So just taking these, I'm going to donate one percent of my income this month to counter current or the VDA or whatever, and then just setting it up so it keeps increasing like 1% at a time. So 1%, then 2%, then 3%. And it makes it a lot a lot more painless to do and a lot, lot more feasible, okay? So the next area that I wanted to talk about, this is another one that I'm not doing well in, but this is what I'd call manor Buddhism or, or brotherhood, right? And this, again, kind of relates to what our societies are like, what our lives are like here in, in Western modernity, right? Where we're atomized and individualized. Yet we're facing these foes, you know, these the Muslims in Europe and so on, who are still living in this sort of clan-based, um, you know, pre-modern societies where they do everything in groups of men. Everything's about brotherhood. And if we look at the most horrible things happening in Europe, it's all stemming from that, right? Like terrorism or the rape gangs. It's all these groups of Muslim men who are, you know, raid, raining massive havoc upon our land. But we don't uh, organize like that anymore. I mean, we are all extremely individualized. And I think that's a battle that we all kind of face in our minds every day towards the temptation to just be individualists and, you know, enjoy the decline, etc., versus purposely kind of organizing in groups of men. And actually, though, there's a lot of guys who I've met at the Northwest Forums and in our movement who I think are, are doing great in this regard and are very inspiring, like the Cascadia guys and the different TRS groups and the Identity of Ropa groups. I mean, I think that is a huge um, positive and they're a, a huge plus in how they're now doing that and how successful they are. I mean, the, like where I come from, there's a group of guys and they meet like twice a month. And it's not that, you know, they're just a group of buddies who would hang out. Anyway, I mean, they're really purposely putting in an effort to meet as a group of men, like-minded men, you know, every week and kind of build that brotherhood and build the skills they collectively have, right? And I think that that's something that is going to be quite crucial if we're going to be successful uh, with all our long-term goals, okay? So that kind of gets into the, the last area that I want to talk about as well. And this is probably the most LARPy area, right? But it's it's also important. And that, that probably, you could, that preparation is what I would call it, right? So being the kind of men, being the kind of groups of men that possess the skills, you know, not just to, to thrive and do well in the, the modern West, but in environments or in societies that are, you know, starting to collapse, right? So in France or Sweden in 20 years, <coughs> if or when, in my opinion, things do start to really collapse and it turns into anarchy, destabilization, et cetera, having the skills that allow us to, to fight in those environments, to thrive, right? And again, those are skills that is not natural for us to possess. It's much more natural for us to wake up every morning and get on our smartphone and then go to our job and then come home and watch television. It is completely unnatural and not easy to go out and become men who know how, you know, know how to fight, know how to use weapons, et cetera, right? So this is another one I'm not particularly doing well in, but it's one I certainly think is tremendously important. So on, on the most basic level, I think you could probably include weightlifting in this. 
right? Just the idea that all men should be strong. You know, our ancestors were strong. We as men were designed to push heavy things around. So I think that's important. But more than that, you know, I think training, knowing how to use guns, right? I mean, these are skills that all of our ancestors possessed for thousands of years until now. You know, like 500, 1,000 years ago, if you were a man and you weren't capable of using lethal force to protect yourself and your family, you were like a joke, right? I mean, you would have been laughed at, beaten up, robbed, killed, whatever. So trying to build these skills, uh, you know, MMA training, et cetera, which is something I hope to get into in the next year, something I hope to get my son into, you know, like youth martial arts, um, weapons training, knowing how to use weapons, things that are completely not natural today in the modern West, but which are absolutely integral to becoming the kind of men we want to be, the kind of people we want to be, who honor our ancestors and are capable of fighting back against the destruction of the West, not just in the kind of modern West we see around us right now, but in any kind of scenario where things are collapsing and destabilizing, right? And if we're going to be able to meet our, you know, our opponents and on, those are skills we need to have. So again, not trying to be LARPy, but I think it's one of those things, even if, even if the West was on a perfect trajectory and everything was going awesome, and there was a Victor Orban, Victor Orban running every single Western country, they would still be skills that we should, you know, try to to have skills we should try to build just because they're things that that we as men should have anyway, right? So, in uh, in conclusion, I know all this stuff uh, is kind of self improvementy, but that kind of circles back to my point at the beginning that I think um, the same the same reason we want to be the best people we can be the best men we can be, be as strong as we can be, succeed financially, are exactly the same as the reasons that we want to keep Sweden from becoming Muslim. They're exactly the same as the reasons that we want to prevent hundreds of thousands of native British children from being raped in the UK. It's exactly the same. I mean, I think that identitarianism and self-improvement are just two sides of the same coin, right? So I think that Beyond that, though, beyond trying to fight this internal reconquest in our minds every day and be the kind of men who are capable of fighting back and retaking Western civilization, uh, it's also about honoring our ancestors and also honoring our descendants in the future. And if you think about just how powerful it would be, you know, all the men across the West who share our views, you know, whether it's one million or ten million, if all ten million of us are all lifting weights every day, right? If we're all training and we know how to use guns, if we're all doing MMA training, if we're all um, striving to have self-supporting income and not have to rely on working for Global Corp or all these other awful corporations, right? If we're all organizing as groups of men and purposely trying to build that kind of brotherhood, if we're all dedicating as much of our time as possible, taking control of our time and dedicating it to this cause, all right, if we're all creating content and trying to be productive to advance these goals that we have, I think our, our capability for achieving them would be absolutely enormous and that we not only would honor our ancestors who fought and died so that we could be here today, but also ensure that our descendants uh, are born into societies that continue that legacy. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions?